Welcome to Let's Get Technical, the IES video series where we're digging into the details of technical rules and regulations, what they mean for the environment, and some of their unintended consequences. At the heart of the series is the relationship between science, policy, and practical delivery. It's all about asking how we turn our ambitions into reality. Agriculture is a massive part of the UK's environment, and it's a massive part of the UK economy. So we need to look at the ways it can contribute to our social, economic and environmental objectives. I spoke with IES member Ian Davis to get his answers to our big three questions. What's the problem? What does it cost us? And what can we do about it? Let's hear what Ian has to say. Hi, I'm Ian Davis. I'm a second generation farmer, mainly farming crops and livestock. I'm a member of the Institute of Environmental Sciences. I'm a chartered member of the Institute of Water Environment Management. I spent 23 years managing rivers for the EA, and I am now a speaker on the agricultural environment and an advocate for agroecology. Agriculture has caused some huge problems with the environment in the UK. Shortage of food in the Second World War uh, was addressed through the Dig for Victory campaign, as part of which something like six million acres of um, mainly pasture land was converted to cropland. A lot of this was um, was river valley bottoms. Following that, the end of the Second World War, we had the 47 Agriculture Act, which sought to increase agricultural output through uh, the adoption of um, modern techniques and intensification, what came to be known as the Green Revolution. Farmers were encouraged to adopt uh, fertilizer use, to make much more use of pesticides, to become much more efficient by adopting the use of, of modern machinery and enlarging fields. And as a result of all of this, the, there was quite a, a substantial increase in output. Typical wheat yield in, on an arable farm went from something like two and a half tonnes a hectare to uh, in the region of eight, eight and a half tonnes a hectare, and typical output from a dairy cow doubled. However, that has had all sorts of implications for the natural environment. We now are widely considered to have one of the most nature depleted landscapes um, of any developed country. The State of the Nature report from the Environment Agency highlights a whole range of deficits that we, we face at the moment. And the, the situation is nicely summarised by a, a book that came out last year called Rooted by Sarah Langford, where she says, farmland birds have declined more sharply than birds of any other kind of habitat, their populations plummeting by over half in just 30 years. 40% of all insect species have declined since the 1960s. Rivers are losing plant life and whole populations of freshwater fish because of algal blooms caused by nitrate runoff from fertilizers. The reasons are complicated because nature is complicated and it is not just one factor that is responsible, but many all at once. That's a, a neat summary of the current state of the, the UK environment and our soils, which has a, um, a wide range of costs for British society. Something like 10% of the UK's climate emissions, according to DEFRA, come from agriculture. The bulk of that is taken up by methane emissions from livestock and nitrous oxide emissions as a result of fertiliser use. It's estimated that around £420 million pounds is the, the cost to the UK from loss of pollination from um, declining insect species. Flooding has long been a problem in the in the UK, but it's one that's certainly increasing, estimated to cost the, the UK economy somewhere around £1.4 billion pounds a year. And a significant proportion of that can be laid at the door of landscape scale change that's taken place as a result of the agricultural intensification. Food security is a significant issue for the UK. We have clawed our way back from a low in the 1930s of about 30% food self-sufficiency in the UK to around 60% now, but that's significantly threatened by the deterioration in the health of our soils and by the decline in things like our effective pollination. There's a loss of amenity in the landscape for the general public as a result of the changes that we've seen. 
the the degradation of our soils was estimated in 2010 to cost the the UK economy somewhere around 1.2 billion pounds a year and it's thought that our arable soils have lost between 40 and 60 percent of their carbon so there's a wide range of costs to society of this and then on top of that is the simple fact that despite somewhere around three billion pounds a year of agricultural subsidy going into into UK agriculture most farms are barely profitable so no one's actually really benefiting from the, the situation that we find ourselves in. Declining agricultural productivity has driven many farmers to intensify their production methods, seeking to, to maintain their, their income levels. This has become one of the major drivers for the depletion of the environment that we're now seeing, particularly following some of the advice that farmers have been given around intensification. This has directly contributed to the damage to the environment because unless a farm's profitable, it's very difficult to undertake any environmental activity alongside the farming practice. Something that's often summarized with the catchy little phrase that it's hard to go green if you're in the red. There have been a number of attempts over the, the last 30 years to address this with very limited success. In the 1990s, the agricultural subsidy regime was very much based upon a payment for productivity. In the early 2000s, that link between productivity and payment was broken and the, the subsidy was split into two pillars, pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one, around two thirds of the sum, was paid on the basis of the area of land that you farmed. And pillar two was used to attempt to fund agricultural environmental schemes. In particular, we saw the entry level stewardship, higher level stewardship, countryside stewardship. Those have been through various iterations up until we left the European Union with very limited actual benefits shown for the near million pounds a year paid for them. As a result of the Agriculture Act 2020 and the Environment Act 2022, we are now going through the biggest change in agricultural policy regime since the Second World War, which is very much aimed at changing that funding over entirely to the reward for the delivery of public goods under what's called the Environmental Land Management Scheme. It's been a slow process for DEFRA to, to put that scheme together. There's been an awful lot of parties involved, including uh, quite a few of the organisations which are form part of the Institution of Environmental Sciences. We're starting to see some clearer picture of how it's going to work now. And we are seeing agriculture change as a result. The picture is a little bit less clear at the moment in the devolved nations because agriculture is a devolved responsibility. The Scottish government are a little bit further ahead than the Welsh and Northern Ireland assemblies in terms of showing direction of future travel, but they're all heading in roughly the same sort of direction. There is an inherent difficulty in structuring an effective agricultural environment scheme, given the, the diversity of, of farms. Mm. Um, and the initial offering was quite a simple scheme with a, almost a, a small menu of options, but that's evolved now into a scheme that because of attempts to, to make the scheme more attractive to farmers and improve its delivery into a scheme that's become incredibly complicated. The general feeling within agriculture seems to be that it's something that farmers can work with. The problem that it's introduced is because it's, it's become such a complex document. The documents itself is 156 pages of guidance DEFRA are currently saying that farmers would be looking at this alongside continuing to operate countryside stewardship agreements as well, the two being complementary, and the guidance for the, the mid-tier countryside stewardship is 226 pages. And this is for businesses which are overwhelmingly sole traders or small partnerships who will struggle to have the time to, to thoroughly understand and make best use of the opportunities that schemes offer them 
there is an overwhelming need now for thoroughly engaged, sympathetic advice to farmers to help them to navigate the opportunities that are in front of them and to really turn it into something that delivers on the farm and starts to reverse this long-term decline. The devil is going to be in the detail of how we do that, and that's not an easy answer. There is hope, quite apart from the three parts of the environmental land management scheme, in that over the, the last 10 years or so, there has been an increasing interest within UK agriculture in working more in sympathy with nature, particularly highlighted by the idea of regenerative agriculture. The mainstream of agriculture is really yet to, to take this on board, but we're starting to see uh, increasing interest from the agricultural press. We're starting to see more information sharing between farms about how they can alter the way that they manage their land in order to farm more in sympathy with nature. And we are seeing more public events being run to share information between farms about how to manage their land in a different way. The main agricultural conference each year for a long time has been the Oxford Farming Conference held in January. Around a decade ago, a parallel conference started up called the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which was very much about farming in sympathy with nature, about farming and its impact on civil society and food sovereignty. And in the last few years, the mainstream media and farming in general have started to take as much notice of the real farming conference as the main Oxford farming conference. Secondly, around eight years ago, a little event started up to share regenerative agriculture ideas between farmers called Groundswell. It takes place in June each year in Hertfordshire. It's now grown to the point where uh, senior politicians attend, where over 5,000 people attend each year, and it started spinning off educational events in other parts of the country. This year saw Groundswell Outreach at Falkland in uh, the Central Belt in Scotland, Carbon Cooling in Cumbria, and there are proposals for a Groundswell-related event in Wales, Northern Ireland, and the Southwest over the next few years. All of this gives hope for the fact that agriculture is actually changing and that some of these issues are amenable to different ways of working that will start to recover a lot of the damage that we've seen in the past. Farmers manage something like 70% of the land surface of the UK. As a result, there's no way that we can reverse the damage that's done in the past and achieve the government's 25-year environment plan without farmers changing their management and coming on board.